Hi, everyone, and welcome to the visuals presentation. Uh, I'm very excited to be bringing you this content. Of course, I would love to bring it to you in person, but we're going to do this virtually. And I'm hoping that everyone is well and able to watch this uh, safely at home. If you have any questions, I am available on email. So looking forward to connecting with you on any questions you might have. The goal for today is to talk about slides in a successful presentation. So we're gonna be going over slide visuals. Last time we talked about presentations, uh, we talked more about purpose, audience, and structure from a big picture, so talking a lot about the why. Today we're gonna to get into some of the details of how you should design your slides, and I'm even gonna share some examples to help you. Um, we'll also be going a little bit over the presentation rubric, which is a checklist that I use to help evaluate your presentation. So gonna give you a preview of that. Uh, without further ado, let's dive in. So just as a review, the last time we met, I shared that these were some of the questions that we thought you might have. You know, how do you make your season senior design presentation successful? How are professional presentations different from presentations that you've been doing in school? How do you get buy-in from your sponsors and professors? How do you keep your audience's attention? And how do you organize your project presentations? And then we started to talk about a little, you know, during a presentation as a presenter, what can you do to be a successful presenter? Now, of course, because we're gonna be talking a lot about virtual presentations in the next couple weeks, that's a little bit different than giving an in-person presentation. So I'm gonna be sharing a lot of resources on both because of course, in the future in your career, you're gonna give a lot of in-person presentations and I want you to have some tips for that. But also I know that you're gonna be doing virtual presentations here in the next couple weeks. So I want you to have resources for that. And that's also helpful for your career for when you have to do those virtual presentations. So we'll be sharing both. So this is a review from last time. And if you remember, just like last time, we're gonna be talking about this in the structure of purpose, audience, and structure. Those are the three areas that we tackle when we talk about presentations. We're gonna keep that same format today. As a quick reminder, my name is Sarah Glova. I'm the founder of Reify Media, and I work with the nonprofit Riot. I also have a co-presenter, Crystal Dreisbach, and she often helps review presentations as well. Uh, with everything being a bit unknown, we're not sure how much she's gonna be able to contribute this semester, but just in case you get the chance to meet her, I want to include her information here. We enjoy working with students every semester, and we're gonna be excited to provide feedback on your presentations. To kick us off today, since we're talking about PowerPoint visuals, I thought I'd share one of my favorite videos. It's a TED Talk, it's a little bit older, but it's called How to Avoid Death by PowerPoint, and I thought we could look at this together. I'm gonna share the link so you can watch the full thing later if you'd like, but here's a piece that I really enjoy from it. What am I talking about? What are the PowerPoints I'm referring to? Well, they can look like this. Now, this is one of the top three universities in the world advising their students and their teachers on how to Feel great PowerPoint. I received this from a customer, and you've got to be semi blind in order to even have something like this in the company. I love this one. This one was awarded the price of being the worst PowerPoint delivered by a public CEO in 2010. It's a nice price to pick up, isn't it? Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> well done, mate. I mean, like, this is bad. Can it get worse? It can. Now, this is the UN in Afghanistan, US military, describing the situation in the area. And, uh, well, there are no comments on that. But then we get this one. My God, David Phillips, this has got to be the thing. This has got limited amounts of text. It's got a supporting image. It's got a clear headline. This is the truth. Well, the thing is, if you recognize yourself in any of these, which I think you do, nodding away, I want to make you aware of the following. That if you've delivered a presentation with something like that behind you, 90% of what you said was gone within 30 seconds. 
And we can share a bit more about, you know, why is he talking about 90% is gone in 30 seconds? Uh, you know, how did he get that number? I invite you to watch the full video. It's about 20 minutes. It's, it's pretty funny. Uh, but it also shares some really good tips about giving presentations. When we're doing presentations and we're speaking to people and showing them visuals, um, we're asking them to pay attention and to use their working memory. And that can be difficult to do. It can be difficult to absorb a lot of information. So if you have really busy slides or slides that people are reading instead of paying attention to you, then it's going to be harder for people to commit things to memory. So what we're going to talk about today is how to create slides that support your content, uh, but don't overwhelm your audience members. And we're also going to have to talk about how to make your slides look good. I'm not expecting any of you to walk away from this as graphic designers. I promise that I'm not gonna ask you to uh, do anything super complicated with your slides. We're gonna talk about simple strategies for uh, designing your PowerPoint slides. All right, so let's dive in. Again, following the structure we used last time, let's talk a little bit about purpose first. As you remember from last time when we talked about purpose, it was, you know, what's the purpose? What's the impact of your project? And thinking about that, you know, what's the impact on members of your audience or the company you're working for? So the, the sponsor or the community. So thinking about your project as, you know, what is the purpose? Why are we doing it? And we use that word why a lot. We talked about starting with why, that Simon Sinek concept. We watched that video where he talked about how Apple does such a great job with that. And we talked about how we should put the why before the how or the what. And we did a little exercise on that. If you have that in front of you, uh, that's great. If not, no problem. Just try to remember for a second. When we were together last time, we did this exercise in your groups and you and your group worked to list out the different ways that your proposal, that your solution could impact others. I asked you to define the why. And remember, these impacts can be positive or negative. So in your groups, you did a great job of listing out what those impacts would be. Uh, what I'd like to ask you to think about now is as you're thinking about the impacts of, you know, what is it that um, my project is going to do, you know, to the community or to the uh, company, we're going to extend that a little bit and think about how we des describe that in our presentation. Um, I'm going to use an example as we go through this to help you think this through. So here's an example. What if your project was working on making school drop-off line more efficient? So maybe a school is the sponsor and they've said to you, you know, our school drop-off line is very inefficient. We um, are seeing lots of traffic jams. We want you as a student group to help us redesign it. So maybe you and your group would write out a couple impacts like, okay, this impacts the students and parents who have to wait. This impacts the staff and the admin of the school, maybe with their school reputation or even school safety because pickup lines need to be safe with these moving cars and children. Um, and it does impact the community because it can create traffic. So maybe you did a good job um, last time of defining those impacts. What we're going to do today as we talk about presentation visuals and how you structure your presentation is we're going to extend that a bit. And I want you to take that why statement and add in your solution. Let me repeat that. Take the why statement that you developed the last time we were together, so why your project is important, and I want you to add your solution to it. Now, your solution is something that you will know, you know by the end of your project. This is whatever you've created to solve the sponsor's problem. That's your solution. It's not something that you had at the beginning of the project, right, because you hadn't created it yet. But in working together this semester, you've created a solution to address this, um, and that's what I want you to add here. So thinking about your impact statement and your solution, um, let's combine those. Here's an example of how that might look. The school drop-off line is inefficient. It could be safer, more efficient, and less of a drain on staff time, parent time, and community traffic resources. Okay, so this part here that I'm highlighting, that's the why. That's what you did last time. But look at this, here's the solution. To solve this issue, our team used simulations to determine the most efficient drop-off line entry points. Our new drop-off flow proposal could save families up to 30 minutes per day, reduce staff time at drop-off, and cut traffic impacts in half. Okay, so what we have here is the combination of your why statement and your solution, and this is very succinct. There's a term for this. 
we call this a bluff statement or a bottom line up front. If you can create a statement like this, then in the beginning of your presentation, you can make it very clear to your audience why your project is important and what your group did. So I'm gonna challenge you to work with your group and to create this bluff statement. I'm gonna be looking for it. So if um, you've looked at the presentation checklist or presentation rubric, uh, then you've already seen, you know, this is how it looks. It's a rubric that I use to evaluate your presentations. This is just one section of it. And in it, you'll see that I specifically look for that bluff statement within the first few minutes of your presentation. So again, that's the statement of, you know, why are you doing this project? Why does it matter? And what are you doing? What's the solution? Um, and being very specific. So you'll see here that they call out, you know, what they did. They used simulations to figure out the most efficient uh, entry points. And then they describe, you know, what is this proposal going to do? Well, it could save families up to 30 minutes a day and then cut traffic impacts in half, reduce staff time at drop off. So it's very specific. So I challenge you and your group to go ahead and work on creating this bluff statement as soon as you can, making sure to have some of those specific quantifiable pieces right there in the beginning. Let's talk about what this looks like on a slide. A lot of times in the beginning of a presentation, I see a slide like this, and I want you to try to avoid this. First of all, there's a lot of content here. Um, it, it could probably be broken up into multiple slides. If you bring up a slide like this and you start talking it through, you might start talking through purpose and I'm over here reading objectives. So don't give us so much content right away. Um, here's an example of how this slide can be improved. I'll let you look at this for a second. So let's notice a couple things that have changed. One, we made the header a little bit stronger. This is not the most important piece of content on your slide. It's good to have headers and different things to help people understand where you are in a presentation, but it shouldn't be the most important piece on your slide. We've got the impact statement right here. So this is the why, and then here's the solution. Now you notice I haven't written out the full paragraph on this slide. So for example, you know, I'm telling you that your bluff statement should look like this. That doesn't mean you just put your bluff statement on a slide. It's gonna look something like this, where here's the why, warehouse storage is inefficient, costing money and time. When you describe that, you might say more. You might say that the CEO of the company is the one who noticed this and is so concerned about it that he hired you all as a senior design project to address it. Um, but on your slide, this is the only text you would need because you're gonna say the rest of it. And then you would say that your goal in the project was to design a new layout, and that you wanted to re reach a 20% waste reduction. So there's that specific number that we were talking about having. What you have here is a beautiful slide that quickly describes the bluff, and it's gonna be a good visual for when you're standing in front of it and, and talking about it, or if it's virtual, um, when you're adding audio and talking about it. Such a difference between what we see here and what we see here. Again, the problems here that we mentioned there's just too much content on here. People are going to be trying to read this rather than listen to you. You can still say all of this when you're on the slide. You can still talk about how important it is to improve safety and efficiency. Um, you can still talk about this 20% weight waste reduction and all the other success criteria, but you don't have to have all of this on the slide. That's what I want to really reinforce. And having a slide like this you can still talk about all the points that were in the other slide, but you're not gonna be distracting people with your visuals. They're gonna be able to listen to you while you talk this through, um, but you've made that bluff statement, the bottom line up front, really clear. Okay. So just to recap, when we're talking about purpose and thinking about presentation visuals, I really want you to focus on your bluff statement. It should share the impact of your project, which is something we worked really hard on last time, and it should also summarize the main point or the end goal of your project. It should summarize that solution, the 20% weight reduction, uh, waste reduction, or the uh, 30 minute wait time reduction. Um, share that within the first few minutes of your presentation. Uh, I will be looking for that and you'll see that called out on the presentation checklist. Okay, we're cruising right along now that we've talked about purpose. Let's dive in and talk about our next next section, which is audience. Uh, and we're going to talk about how you can even integrate that into your bluff statement a little bit. 
as a reminder, last time when we talked about audience, we tried to reinforce people support your ideas because of the why, but you still need to connect that why to things that are important to them. So it's very important to think about, for example, who's going to be in the room when you're doing your presentation, who's going to be on the conference line when you're doing your presentation, because you're going to want to connect your content to them and to what's important to them. And that's a huge piece of how presentations are successful in the business world. And if you remember, we talked about this last time by trying to list out stakeholders and thinking about the impacts to them. So this is an exercise that you did last time we were together. What I'd like you to think about now is get that same stakeholder list out, think about your stakeholders, and see if you can integrate them into your bluff statement. So for example, if we take that same school drop-off line, you know, this is the example that I shared with you earlier, where the group has looked at the why here, so the school drop-off line is inefficient, and then their solution here to solve the issue, they use simulations, cut um, time up by 30 minutes. So here's the one that we looked at already. What I want you to do is to take this statement and integrate the different stakeholders. Here's what that might look like. So really calling out that it's not safe for students, it's time consuming for parents, inefficient and expensive for staff, line causes community traffic backups. So for this group, the stakeholders were the students, the parents, the staff, and the community. So now they've done a good job here of specifically looking at, you know, in their bluff statement, where are these stakeholders addressed? Where do I specifically address their needs? The reason I want you all to do this is because it helps to make sure that your bluff statement is doing a good job of addressing the stakeholder needs. So uh, before you finalize your bluff statement, do this quick audience challenge and see if you're doing a good job of integrating all of your different stakeholders in your bluff statement. What you might find is doing this exercise might expand your bluff statement a little bit. You might have to add a line or two. Now, at the end of the day, your bluff statement can't describe your whole project. So you might have to make choices about who are the most important stakeholders as it relates to your project or what are the most important parts of your solution. So I'm not saying that your bluff statement should be like a summary paragraph of your entire project. There's going to be stuff that you leave out. And that's okay because you're going to give this whole long presentation. The bluff statement is just what you share in the very beginning to outline your why, your impact, um, and also to outline what you did, your solution. So don't stress about trying to describe every aspect of your project here, but make sure you've got the why statement, the solution, and your most important stakeholders addressed. Now, if we were together in a classroom, we would spend some time on this, and I would ask you to brainstorm with your group about how you could better integrate the different audience groups. But since we're not together in real time, what I'm going to challenge you is uh, go ahead and work on this exercise, work on it with your group, and then I hope that you'll share it with me. We're going to have an opportunity to do almost like office hours or workshops where I work with the groups individually, and I'll encourage you to have a draft of your bluff statement when you meet with me. That way I can share feedback and we can workshop it a little bit. So we don't have to work on this together now, but it is something I want you to be working on with your groups. And of course, when I do the presentation evaluations, I already mentioned that your bluff statement is part of that rubric. Definitely want to see that. A couple audience tips when it comes to the presentation visuals. Um, we already talked about how with an audience right in the introduction, you need to address the purpose, the impact, and the solution. That's going to be really important to do right away. Um, you can really win or lose your audience right in that introduction, in the first part of your presentation. So that's why I outline that here. Um, you also want to explain any background information that the audience might need to know. That could be simple definitions. There are some terms in your project that might be really familiar to you by now since you've been working on them, but that the 
rest of us might not know. So maybe you need to share some definitions. Maybe you need to share some simple background information about the company that you worked with. Maybe they're not as well known. When you do your presentation for your sponsor, you would probably cut that out because of course they know who they are, but just think about the background information that your audience might need to know. When you're presenting to your sponsor, maybe they need to know about these NC State senior projects. Maybe there's some people in the room who don't know who you are or why you're there and you can share a brief summary of that. So um, work to explain that background inf information right in the introduction. And then this is important. We're gonna talk about how to do this, but please provide an agenda slide. Agenda slides get a really bad rap because a lot of times the ones that people include are really boring or unnecessary. So we'll talk about how to make a good one, but it's a good idea to give your audience a preview of what you're gonna talk about. And that's what an agenda slide, a good agenda slide should do. So speaking of agendas, we are moving right along and we're about to start our third section, Structure. This is really the meat of what I wanted to talk to you about today. So we talked a little bit about how to integrate the why as we talked about purpose and how to create that as a bluff statement. We talked about audience and how to make sure your bluff statement addresses your different stakeholders. Um, and we talked about some strategies for capturing your audience attention and making sure that they feel like you're explaining the content and the background to them right from the introduction. So we've talked about that. Let's talk about structure. Let's dive into how do you actually build these presentation slides? What should they look like? What should they include? Um, a little bit more specific on that. Now, if you remember last time when we talked about structure, our big point was don't save the ending. This is not a novel where you're gonna wait and do a big reveal at the end. It's not a lab report where you're gonna go week one to week 16 and kind of save your solution for the end. You wanna start with the purpose and then only include the information your audience needs. You're not necessarily gonna follow a project charter or anything like that or some kind of big document report. The presentation is designed for you to share the information that's the most relevant to the audience. We talked about that last time. Uh, we also talked a little bit about how you need to do this preview, tell, remind format, how you need some repetition. So tell your audience what you're going to tell them, give them a preview, uh, then tell them, provide the content, and then tell them what you told them, remind them. Uh, some people say that you need to repeat things three times in order for someone to remember it. So that could be a good rule of thumb if you like to uh, follow kind of an easy rule like that. But what I really want to emphasize here is you should give us a preview of your content. Let us know what you're going to be talking about. And then of course you're gonna share that content, but then remind us, make sure you have some kind of wrap up or conclusion. We'll talk more about how to do that. Let's go through some tips here together that are very practical. So first of all with structure, do not use your charter structure for your presentation. When you create a project charter, it might look something like this. Purpose, objective, scope, key assumptions and constraints, risk and risk responses, budget, role and responsibilities, milestones and deliverables, success criteria. I have seen students do presentations where they literally follow this format and have a slide on each of these and that's their presentation. And I want to encourage you strongly not to do that because then your presentation feels a lot more like a lab report. As we get into, you know, halfway through your presentation, it would be around here. We still don't really know the impact or the solution that you're gonna be talking to us about. Don't follow this format. Instead, think about what your audience needs to know. Ask yourself these open-ended questions. What's the problem you're solving? Why are you there? What, what problem are you solving? And what's the solution? How did you solve it? What's the answer? What's the end? Think about what you did. And then what's the follow-up? What is this group gonna have to do to continue on your success? What are the next steps? What are your recommendations? It's really important to avoid that week one to week 16 storyline where you say, okay, so we started our project. Here's what they asked for. At first it was really hard because da, 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 da. And then you just go through it like you're going in chronological order. Do not do that. Instead, focus on the deliverable. This isn't a start to finish recap of what you did. It's key highlights. It's not a lab report. It's not gonna include everything it can't. You simply don't have enough time. It's not about how you arrived at the solution. You're not taking a step-by-step -step week one to week 16 through how you arrived at that solution, but it's why the solution is or isn't the right one for the sponsor. 
this is maybe the most important thing to think about is you're developing your presentation, you're developing it in order to share why the solution that you worked on is or isn't the right solution uh, for the sponsor. And when you look at the presentation rubric, you're gonna see that in structure, we call this out, we look at whether the content progresses logically, so not necessarily chronological. We look to see if you're doing a good job of providing an agenda, then sharing content, and then having a conclusion, this preview, tell, remind format. And then this is a key one. We look at whether your vital points, points have the most time or slides, while extraneous info is excluded or in the backup slides. A lot of times what that looks like is, you know, are they spending five minutes describing each of their key stakeholders when, you know, we really don't need to know that? Or are they doing a good job of really keeping their time on, you know, the big pieces about their solution? So that's something that we pay attention to. You'll also see that with graphics and visuals, we have a couple structure pieces, and I'd like to go through those with you now too. With graphics and visuals, one of the first things we look at is whether the visuals do a good job of explaining or reinforcing your main points. No superfluous graphics cluttering the slides. Basically, don't have clip art for clip art's sake. Now, I'm not saying that all clip art is bad, and I, I understand you want to have visuals on your slides. I hope you will have visuals on your slides, but it should serve a purpose. You shouldn't just have content to have it there. Uh, we ask that you have one main point per slide. We're gonna talk about what that means. Obviously, text on slide is limited. We've kind of talked about this already that you should really be using visuals to connect your audience to your points instead of having paragraphs of text that you read. And then this is an easy one. Colors contribute to rather than distract from the presentation. So, you know, using colors that it's not hard for us to read, uh, things like that. So let's look at some examples of this and talk more about how you can make these things a reality. First of all, the one point per slide rule. Let's look at what that looks like. A lot of times we see slides like this, where here's the slide we're looking at. Um, we've got, okay, some visuals and a couple bullets. That's gotta be okay, right? Well, there's actually a lot of content here and they have two points here. They have this point and this point. So what they could do instead, since it doesn't cost you anything to have an additional slide is divide those out. And then you can talk about the first point and then move to the next slide and talk about the next point. So be careful when you're developing slides, not just to have bullet lists and think about what you're really trying to describe. Think about whether you need to divide that content out. Another way that that looks for one main point on slide is look at all these facts. Maybe they're trying to um, share that, this organization has been around for a long time, it's very big with employees, it's done a lot of work, but it's hard to get um, the point of this very quickly. And so having a slide that very succinctly gets to the main point and only has one main point is very helpful. Um, so when you're sharing facts, think about if it's helpful to have one slide for each of them. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. A few statistics. So when we say start with why and start with why something is important, I sometimes see a lot of slides like this where they're listing off statistics that help to prove that their topic is important. But it's really hard to read this and feel like, okay, this topic is really important. Um, plus, again, you're going to be talking about this point and I'm going to be already down here reading this one. When you present people with a list, they try to read it. So look what they did here instead. They took one of the most important points and they called it out here, made the number very big. Now, importantly, whoever is presenting this slide can still share these other statistics. You can still talk about this, but you don't need to have each one written out on the slide. You're gonna use your voice, your audio to share that. Um, and so have a slide that more quickly makes this relevant to us. And then sure, keep talking about these. Um, but have one main takeaway. This is gonna be so much easier for me to remember. So when we talk about one main point per slide, that's what we mean. Do a good job of not putting, you know, just blocks of information on your slide, uh, bullet points of information on your slide, divide those points out, try to share one thing at a time, and think about calling out the most important or um, maybe even most impactful statistic, and use your audio, your voice, to share the rest of it. Now there is one exception here, your agenda slide. Please don't 
have an agenda slide where you only have one come in at a time <laughs> on your agenda, you know, you can have all the different agenda items there. Um, and the reason I share this is, you know, I don't want to see your presentation and see that you only have like one tiny thing on each slide because you're trying to follow this rule. Use your best judgment. If the point of your slide is to share your agenda, you can have all your agenda items there and talk through them. Um, but the, the point is to stay away from stuff like this that just presents a wall of content. Uh, try to make it a little bit easier for us to understand visually. You can still use audio to describe this. So one main point. The main point on this slide is that these are the things we're gonna go over today, so that's fine. Um, so I wanted to point out that exception. I'm not saying have one thing on your slide. It just means one main point per slide. Another rule, highlight relevant data. This is very important for your industry. Please continue to do this after you graduate. I see slides like this that share content, share data. Please don't do this. It makes it very hard for us to understand what you want us to look at. If you want to talk through a slide like this, for example, with Seattle, Chicago, New York, and Portland, highlight the most relevant piece and then move on. So for example, when you're talking about Portland, highlight Portland. Make it easy for me to see which one you're talking about. And then when you're talking about New York, you can do the same thing and gray out Portland and make New York uh, that green color again. But highlight what we're looking at. Uh, we don't want to have slides like this where there's just so much content that we can't understand where you want us to look. Um, a lot of slides I see from you all are visuals that have really complicated graphics and you're talking through them and you're saying things like, well, as you can see, you know, in this area and, you know, you are maybe trying to point to the slide, use graphics. If you want us to notice a part of your visual, just highlight it or put a square or a circle or an arrow and then you can create a next slide where that arrow moves and then you're talking about another part of the graph. Don't just put a graph on the slide. Make sure you tell us what you want us to pay attention to on that graph. That's really important, so I'm gonna repeat it. Don't just put a graph or a complicated visual or a table on a slide and then talk through it. Use visuals to help us understand where you want us to look. Highlight the most relevant data as you're talking about it. And you might create quite a few slides to do that. Rather than having just one slide with a graphic, create 10 different versions of it with an arrow that moves to a different place on each of those slides. You might go through those quickly, but it makes it easier for us to understand where we should be looking. And then finally, purposeful graphics only. Um, this whole, like, I need to have a fancy slide background thing, it's really unnecessary. This graphic doesn't help. It's very hard to read this text. Um, and obviously, we shouldn't have a block of text like that. So get rid of that. Um, this is an overview description where they're talking about how Caterpillar is moving a frame assembly process from Mexico to their Sanford, North Carolina plant. So have a graphic that's more relevant. You could literally replace that whole wall of text with just this, and then you could say all of that. You could say Caterpillar is moving from the spot where they had in Mexico to the spot in Sanford, and with that move, they need to consider X, Y, you know, you can go on and on. But this graphic helps to make that really memorable. It's going to be very easy for us to remember as you go through your presentation why we're paying attention to this, what, what you're trying to address. So these are the three slide rules I want you to really keep in mind as you're designing slides. Again, not trying to make anyone a graphic designer, but trying to point out things that you can remember, take with you in your future career um, that are easy to implement. Have one main point per slide. It's not expensive to add a slide, so go ahead and do that. Highlight relevant data. Use graphics to highlight on a visual, on a chart, on a table, um, what you want us to be looking at. And purposeful graphics only. Don't have anything clip -arty or um, you know, fancy design backgrounds that don't add to the content. Use purposeful graphics. And as often as you can, try to replace text with a visual that shows what you mean rather than just says what you mean. All right, so let's do a quick recap of what we've talked about today. We talked about purpose and how we have to share the why, not the how or the what, which is a little bit of a review from last time. What we added on this time is that when you're sharing that impact, add the solution and share that impact plus solution right away. And that is called our bluff statement. Um, next, we talked about audience. So tailoring your purpose statement to your audience. 
just like we went over last time, you're really trying to anticipate their questions. You're trying to think about all the different stakeholders and what the specific questions those stakeholder groups are gonna have. And that's why we wanna work so hard to make sure all the stakeholders are address addressed in the bluff statement. And then structure, this is where the biggest piece of our content was today. We reviewed that it's not beginning to end. You start with your main point, your takeaway, your bluff statement. Please use your presentation checklist rubric to help you design your PowerPoint. It's gonna include a lot of helpful information. Um, it's gonna have some specific guidelines that we wanna see from you, so please use that. And then the three main points we shared today, have one main point per slide, highlight the relevant data, and include purposeful graphics. As part of today's presentation, I'm gonna be sending your instructors the um, Death by PowerPoint TED Talk video, and then I'm gonna share a number of resources related to how to give virtual presentations with tips for that. And I'll also share some information on giving in-person presentations, so you'll have both. We're also gonna create some office hours or some basically workshop time where you're gonna have a chance to sign up for a time session with me where I work with your group on your presentation and I'll look forward to seeing your bluff statements at that time. Uh, in the meantime, please don't hesitate if, to let me know if there's other resources I can be sharing. Uh, thank you so much for paying attention today. Stay well, stay safe, stay home, and uh, looking forward to connecting with you all soon. Thanks so much.